Hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel on adaptation limits and transformational change. Today, we have representatives joining us from South America, Africa, Europe, and Asia. So I would like to wish you a good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. We are here today to discuss the limits of adaptation to climate change and whether transformational change in climate risk management can remove some of the expected residual risks and losses and damages that are bound to follow. This is a panel discussion followed by an interactive Q&A with the audience. So the audience is very welcome to submit your questions during the panel discussion, and I will raise them by the end of the session. This event is organized by International Universities Climate Alliance and the University of Zurich, uh, and is part of a set of events during the UN Climate Conference COP26 that is happening right now in Glasgow. My name is Isabel Hagen, and I am a PhD candidate at the University of Zurich. I'm researching the limits uh, of climate change adaptation in the Peruvian Andes. A big welcome to today's panel. With us, uh, we have Sumiti Pava, uh, Pahava Gaja, a Plan Adapt Fellow and Associated Senior Researcher. Uh, she has more than a decade's experience in policy advocacy on climate change adaptation, ecosystems-based solutions, and sustainable development. We also have Jocelyn Ostolasa with us. She is a National Program Officer for Climate Change Issues at the Swiss Agencies for Development and Cooperation, uh, and she's managing several initiatives in climate change adaptation and mitigation in the Andes. The next panelist is Teresa Doibelli, uh, and she joins us from the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis in Austria. Her work includes research and stakeholder engagement on transformative approaches for building resilience and managing climate-related risks. <clears throat> we also have Thomas Schinko with us. Uh, he is also joining from the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Austria, where he is the group uh, research group leader of the Equity and Justice Group. And his research includes comprehensive climate risk management with a focus on socioeconomic impacts of climate risks and just and inclusive climate risk management strategies. Lastly, we have Linda Menk joining us today. She is a geoinformatics scientist from the University of Salzburg, and her research interests include risks, vulnerability, and loss and damage assessment in the context of climate change and public health. Thank you all, uh, panelists, for taking the time to be here. Uh, I'm really happy to see you all uh, virtually. And during this panel discussion, I will direct my questions to the panelists, but anyone is welcome to jump in uh, with additional input. So firstly, since I think we have quite a mixed uh, audience with us here today, uh, we could use a short explanation of some of the terms that I have just mentioned. So Teresa, could you explain the concepts of adaptation limits and residual risks for our audience and maybe give some examples? Sure, happy to. Um, so you mentioned adaptation limits and residual risks. So I'll be focusing on those two terms quickly. Um, some of you may have heard what adaptation limits are, if you le or at least you've heard that term being thrown around a lot um, in the debates, I'm sure also um, live at COP26. An adaptation limit represents a sort of a threshold. Um, and beyond that threshold risk process, they rise to levels that are no longer tolerable to the community in question. And they rise in really an unmediated way. And when such a limit is reached, it actually means that there is no more practical adaptation option available. Um, it can also mean that um, only unacceptable measures of adaptive efforts would be feasible, would be required to actually secure um, maintaining the objectives that you want to keep going on. Um, so when you think about this in, in a real life example, probably sea level rise could be a good example to you to illustrate what that means on. Um, sea level rise today, they might be, it might be still possible to bring down risk levels using technical solutions, for example, seawalls and other ways of coastal management. 
um, but only with sufficient resources. And in the long run, this is very often not feasible anyway, because sea levels will continue to rise and the available resources already today are often way too tight to actually keep up with them. And as sea levels rise, um, it will just get tighter and tighter. Um, and so this is really where these adaptation limits that I was explaining just before come in. It means that there is no more practical adaptation option available. In theory, there might be technical solutions, but it's no longer practical. Um, and it's no longer feasible for the localities in question to actually undertake um, those risk, these risk reduction efforts to get risk to a tolerable level. And so when you then think of the term residual risk, it's actually the risk that is referring, it's a term that's referring to the risks that remain in the space beyond adaptation. It's those risks that will still be there even though you've taken disaster risk reduction measures, even when you're taking effective working disaster risk reduction measures, you will still be facing some residual risk. It's just not feasible to reduce risks to a zero level. And so the fact that there is residual risks, it just means that really you need to also always engage in comprehensive risk management. Disaster risk reduction and adaptation alone is not the full, um, is not going to work on its own. Um, and it really also takes us into this loss and damage space because that's for us something that starts in our understanding based on our research, it starts at those limits to adaptation. And so really this fact that there is residual risk, it implies that there is a continuing need to maintain really those effective working capacities for preparedness, response and recovery, resilience capacities. But it also means that we will need to take socioeconomic policies, um, such for example, safety nets, we need to put risk transfer mechanism in place and we just need to engage in comprehensive risk management. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Teresa. That's a really good example as well. And uh, you mentioned now that it depends on the on the countries or the localities' ability to adapt as well. And adaptation limits are often described in a global south context. Um, but we know that climate change knows no borders and is most definitely also affecting the global north. So, Jocelyn, are adaptation limits a global concern, or is there a difference between global north and global south countries? Hi. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Isabel. Well, this is true. Uh, as human, we can we we have the uh, adaptive capacity to try to to manage this kind of uh, challenge uh, related with the climate change. However, in, in related with uh, some conditions, socioeconomic, socio-cultural, also the environment degradation in some areas can be really a, a high importance if we talk about these kind of limits and constraints. Based on that, we really in the South countries, we can uh, consider that there, there are more evidence of these kind of constraints and hard limits than other, other regions. And we can also mention, uh, for instance, based on the, on the families here in, in the Andes, uh, we can, uh, they, 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 they depend of the environmental conditions no? and the sanity of these areas. And, and if we are consider that this kind of uh, degradation is, could be an important uh, limitation in the future, there is a big problem here. So we can mention that if there, these families uh, are not, uh, or they don't have the access to this kind of technology or opportunities to, to adapt uh, to, to these kind of conditions, we, we really need to consider that these families under this, uh, uh, under these kind of conditions can really have a big problem in, in, in a short future. It means that they need to consider, for instance, to move to another areas or a, a start new process in their uh, practices. So I think that the socioeconomic and sociocultural uh, conditions are really a, a high, high important point here. No? Even if we can uh, improve the, the environmental conservation and defense, if they are not, uh, if they don't have 
the, the opportunity to, to access to this kind of knowledge and technology could be really an, issue, an, an important problem, especially in this kind of climate variability and, and change in the in their environment. So in my opinion, the, 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 even if they, for instance, in, in the case of the Andes, one of the maybe most uh, interesting para practices that come coming from the, their uh, traditional knowledge uh, to try to, to face this, this, this change and challenge is related with the water harvest, harvesting, for instance. And it, it, it is really an interesting practice that is, is, is resulting in some important uh, opportunities for the communities. But if we don't know how, where are the limits with this kind of practices based on their traditional knowledge, they, they can be really an, an important problem in a short future because there are a lot of investment, public investment investments uh, promoting this kind of practices, but we don't know if the change in the environment can be, could be a, re a real problem in the short future if they continue with this kind of practices. So I, I think that there is a, an important uh, call to start the coordination between the research and also the, 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 the activities in this, at, the, at this local level, because uh, we are really uh, we, we know that for instance related with in the based on the climate scenarios that there will be some change at yeah, the precipitation and also uh, uh, at this kind of uh, at this level no in the highlands uh, and one of the most uh, and this kind of traditional practices are based on the expecting precipitation and the conditions of, of the uh, environment. But if there is not going to be a, a, a precipitation in the season that we or, or they, they used to have, can be really a, an important problem for, for them and um, for the investment that we are also promoting in, in the highlands. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think that understanding these limits and constraints are really, uh, are, have an important and high, high relevance for guiding the proactive adaptation financing and the governance from the local and also to, to global scale. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jocelyn. It's very interesting to hear examples from, from the ground in the Andes. Um, does anyone else would like to add something to, to Jocelyn's statement? Can I just speak up, Isabel, or should I raise my hands? Um, I I just wanted to briefly mention the the global north perspective here. So we, we recently started a research project here at Yasa where we uh, tried to focus on on this discourse from a global north perspective because uh, very often this discourse is framed uh, from a perspective of global south, legitimately so I would say. Uh, uh, that's where the loss and damage discourse is coming from. But we were interested, are we actually, you know, experiencing losses and damages uh, also in an industrialized country like Austria, which is in the center of Europe, um, are we experiencing adaptation limits? And uh, we are in the midst of this project. And I can tell you, uh, no one really talks about loss and damage in Austria. So this, this whole concept of the capitalized L&D discourse is not really well known. But once you di start digging deeper and, and really talk to people, communities on the ground, you see that there are indeed quite some adaptation limits, more of the softer nature. So there might potentially be uh, technical solutions available, but they're just the, the financial resources or socioeconomic uh, uh, framework conditions are just not in place to, to uh, alleviate those uh, limits. But for example, we, we had um, uh, plant migration in, in Austria uh, due to flood risk. So certain areas, communities have been um, resettled because uh, this was a political decision, um, it, because it was decided there's no further potential to, to uh, build uh, protective measures. We also see that now with increasing temperatures, more drought, more, more heat waves in Austria, 
we see at the, the household level quite some existential risks uh, uh, building up. So certain families who have been in the forestry sector, for example, for decades or even centuries, the whole forests are, are going to die off now and they have to look for new livelihoods. So I think uh, to sum up in, in a, for a global north country, industrialized country like Austria, there won't be an adaptation limit at the nation, the national level. But once you dig deeper, go to the community, to the household level, you will even find quite some uh, strict adaptation limits in, in countries uh, like Austria. Thank you for that addition, Thomas. That's really interesting to also get the, the Global North perspective and clearly more, more um, input um, should come of this if, if these terms are not really mentioned on, on the state level yet. Um, so um, in terms of tackling these climate related risks, um, there are some current approaches um, in climate risk management theories. Um, Sumiti, what would you say is missing from these current approaches, particularly when it comes to these adaptation limits and, and residual risks? Please. Thank you, Isabel. Coming from a climate adaptation perspective and having heard the previous speakers before me, the area which I feel can add a lot of value um, is the domain of ecosystems-based adaptation, nature-based solutions. We've been working on a couple of projects where we are linking up disaster risk reduction, which is ecosystem-based, with the idea that it also attends to the impacts of, climate, of the climate crisis on both nature and people as its focus is on social and environmental systems, ecological systems. So I would say that's one area where, um, at least from my experience, I feel more attention could be paid. The second area would be, as Jocelyn had mentioned previously, the experience of practitioners uh, to be augmented by that of researchers in their work. Similarly, researchers learning from practitioners. So there's almost that uh, feedback loop between these two domains in adaptation where um, there is a lot of knowledge residing in both domains that often needs to be linked together. So at this very moment, we have the Adaptation Research Alliance being launched at the Science and Innovation Day in COP26. And one of the efforts of that alliance, which I'm also part of um, through the ARA Secretariat, is to bring scholars, universities, action um, organizations together. And um, yeah, so we hope to address that gap. Thirdly, I would bring in here uh, an element of a networked way of doing things, um, a collaborative governance uh, way of doing things, especially in a post-COVID world where we are unable to travel like we used to. We are unable to um, meet in person. And this meeting is an example of that. But in the domain of adaptation, I feel that uh, perhaps that needs to be uh, explored further in, in attending to the limits to adaptation as well as residual risks. And finally, which is also the topic of our session, locally led adaptation and bringing communities on board. I think it's um, a, a very powerful tool because often when both research or practice projects are funded by donors and the doning, donor funding sorry, dries out, who actually owns uh, the effort, the initiative is a question mark. So if, a, if an initiative is driven by the need from communities or uh, at least there's a lot of voice and participation of communities in the early stages of a project, then there's almost uh, a good chance that there will be continuity and sustainability. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Sumati. You're bringing in some excellent points here, um, bringing in experiences from practitioners and, and traditional knowledge and local knowledge, absolutely. Um, I was wondering if you could give an example. In the beginning, you mentioned a, a nature-based solution and ecosystem-based solutions. Maybe some of our audience are not familiar with these terms. Could you just give maybe a quick example of these? 
Sure. Uh, from my experience in South Africa uh, as a researcher, there are there's a project that is being funded and run by the C40 Finance Facility, C40 Cities Finance Facility. So urban examples is what I'm more familiar with. Um, and in, therein, there are river stretches that are being restored in the larger uh, Durban municipalities region, as well as the urban core. So I would say that th there are physical impacts that are being considered, which is, you know, so many thousand kilometers of the river being restored, and also looking at employment opportunities for people in river cleaning or actual physical work. So it's um, it's considering the financing of such projects, but again, it takes many years. So often floods can may happen or urban floods may happen once in 10 years or once in, in longer time frames, and it goes out of the imagination of the policymakers or the officials. However, the people who live in certain areas, especially you know informal settlements in developing country cities, um, not just in South Africa, but also Kenya, this they end up facing huge risks and losses or damage from such events, flood risk events. So the example that I'm sharing right now is the Palmyet River rehabilitation, but then there's also uh, great examples from uh, Nairobi in the um, Kibera um, settlement in Nairobi, and then there's also the Mukuru uh, informal settlements uh, work with the Communities uh, Alliance, the Mongano Alliance. So, yeah. Thank you, Sumiti. That was great. And I will make sure to check out the Adaptation Research Alliance that you that you mentioned. It sounds sounds excellent. Um, so any comments from the rest of the panel on on these these issues before I move on? OK, so uh, Thomas, could you outline for us what is comprehensive climate risk management and how can this potentially help with um, some of the previously mentioned issues of, of climate risk management? The floor is yours. <laughs> okay, sure, Isabel. And um, I, I think uh, Sumiti already mentioned a couple of examples what comprehensive climate risk management could actually mean in practice, but I, I would now take a step back and try to um, try to elaborate what this whole concept means. So comprehensive climate risk management as a, as a concept has been around in the literature for quite some time now, a couple of years or a decade at least. And uh, what it actually set out to do is to, to connect the often siloed fields, uh, policy fields of disaster risk management and climate change adaptation in practice. So it connects the rather backward looking focus of DRM and the more forward looking focus of climate change adaptation. And in doing so also embedding both of these dimensions in a broader sustainable development and climate resilience perspective. And I think Sumiti gave very nice examples how this could look in reality. Um, but comprehensive climate risk management also uh, means comprehensiveness in terms of uh, the risks that are being addressed. So it means synergistically addressing sudden onset events, uh, such as floods, uh, which we have mostly in our minds when we talk about disasters. But uh, it also means connecting this, uh, the management of those uh, sudden onset events uh, with slow onset processes, such as sea level rise. And these slow onset processes are historically rather the focus of, of climate change adaptation. So that's where the first discussions on adaptation uh, emerged and uh, slow onset processes like floods, that's the historic focus of disaster risk management. But we also have to keep in mind that these slow onset processes and the sudden onset uh, processes, they interact. Um, so, for example, sea level rise could lead to, to more intensive uh, storm surge. So we have an, an interaction of those two domains and comprehensive climate risk management sets out to take this into account. And how to do this in practice? Um, there are different frameworks that have been developed uh, in the past in the literature uh, to, to at least conceptualize how this could be done in practice. 
For example, at YASA, uh, we have worked together with GSZ in Germany to develop a conceptual framework that allows assessing climate-related risks, both sudden onset and slow onset processes, evaluating existing policy measures and also identifying additional measures that are needed to deal with intensifying climate-related risks. And methodologically, uh, this framework not only uses quantitative top-down risk assessment techniques, as has often been, been done in disaster risk management in the past, cost-benefit analysis, for example, but this framework also requires the application of participatory social science methods to assess the different levels of risk tolerance and adaptive capacities uh, of communities at risk from the bottom up. So it's really a connection of top-down risk assessment and bottom-up uh, stakeholder engaged uh, uh, risk assessment techniques. And in doing so, this allows to overcome some of the problems that we have experienced in the past. So, for example, we can explicitly consider adaptation limits and residual risks from the perspective of those communities or even individuals, households at risk, uh, but also the identification of potential measures to, to tackle those high-end climate-related risks. So I hope this gave some impression of what comprehensive climate risk management could mean. Uh, we could talk about this for many, many more minutes and, and hours, but I, I tried to summarize uh, what one could imagine with this concept. Thank you, Thomas. I appreciate that. Also very interesting to hear about the um, the uh, increased impacts on of of several events and processes happening happening simultaneously and in these compound risks that you mentioned. Um, so would anyone like to add anything to comprehensive climate risk management or do you feel like Thomas covered the important parts? I could just come in and um, mention uh, the gender-based focus that's often considered uh, a quite a big domain in climate adaptation and bringing that um, into the climate risk management uh, assessments at local level is a very strong um, vehicle for also then bringing about change in the future as it's seen that women work in certain ways in families, in communities. So both in um, a coastal resilience project that we documented in Vietnam, as well as the work that uh, adaptation project called Bracet has done. This has proved quite useful. I, I fully agree, Sumiti. I mean, women are in many contexts the change makers that you have to get on board. That's that's very true. Yes, Sumiti, that's a very important uh, aspect to bring in and very fitting because today is gender day at the climate conference. So I'm also very happy that we have a, um, uh, such great women with us today speaking. Feels feels good to have this representation. Um, great. So um, in climate policy context, uh, for example, the UN climate climate negotiations, uh, loss and damage has recently received quite a lot of attention and some uh, are calling it the third pillar um, of climate policy uh, next to mitigation and adaptation. Um, but Teresa, what exactly is the border between adaptation and loss and damage? Could you give an example? Yeah, that's a tough question. I think that many um, that are follow following the debates are asking themselves. Um, and I think that question has not been made easier um, in 2013 when actually COP19 established the Warsaw International Mechanism. I think many uh, observers were hoping for that um, to become a much clearer distinction, but it definitely has um, been as tricky as before, if not um, more since then. Um, if you have read the wording, you probably have noticed that the wording in the Warsaw Mechanism is left ambiguous, purposely so to some extent, um, because it, sta it states that the Warsaw Mechanism fulfills the role of promoting approaches that avert, minimize and address loss and damage um, associated with the adverse effects of climate change. And avert, minimize and address is uh, <laughs> where it becomes complicated and where it starts to really get tricky to draw that border um, that you're asking about. So when you take an equity and justice point of view, um, 
it would appear rather clear what loss and damage um, is, right? And addressing loss and damage would come, uh, what, what will fall under that. Um, it would be this need to, to provide support to communities that are affected by climate change with such an intensity that they can no longer adapt and really need financial support, but also in-kind support to um, rebuild or um, in many cases actually retreat and move away. Um, but practically speaking, it's a tough line to draw. Um, as I said, the language is not just address loss and damage, it is a word minimize and address loss and damage. Um, and even if it were only address loss and damage, um, it's really a complex um, topic to draw that line um, where you would have to decide when the pressure on a community is too high and how can actually that pressure um, from climate change be distinguished from other reasons that factor into the decision to retreat, um, such as non-climate related hazards, or um, <laughs> dare I say, sometimes there's political and economic reasons as well that may factor into a decision to retreat in a certain location. Um, and of course, there's this underlying moral question, can we just, can we accept to give up villages and cities um, where communities have lived oftentimes for not just centuries, but thousands of years, um, for a lot of also um, values are there that are linked to tradition. It's it's sentimental values. It's it's values that cannot be replaced. They cannot be they cannot be moved to another place. Think, for example, of ancestral graveyards um, that have meaning that have religious meaning to communities that cannot be shifted elsewhere. Um, so that's that's a, really a difficult question to answer. But um, at the same time, when you're trying to draw this policy space, um, you need to look also at these two angles of word and minimize to it, um, because that gives way to understanding loss and damage more broadly, understanding it more broadly. Um, and as you're rightly pointing out, really overlapping with adaptation and disaster risk reduction. So not just that space um, that comes into play where the limits to adaptation are neared or breached, but really also um, the measures um, that are required to not, to prevent the extent of, to reduce the extent of um, loss and damage materializing. Um, and it's it's absolutely true that it is important. We need to be doing our best at averting and minimizing loss and damage. There is no question at all about that. Um, but grouping these action items together in the Warsaw Mechanism in this way, it has modeled the policy debates. Um, and it has also modeled the policy debates in a way that has, to some extent, drawn the focus really on this avert and minimize, and less so on the address, where it's a question also of compensation, of support um, that needs to be given to communities affected. And it's just a very, very difficult, also very difficult legal space as well um, to enter. And so really this border question, it's it's tricky um, to answer, but it's important that we find that we try to answer it and that we try to find a way to distinguish loss and damage from adaptation and disaster risk reduction. So at IASA, we do that by referring to the limits to adaptation um, and by really stating that loss and damage comes into play where those limits to adaptation are reached, where there's no more practical adaptation or risk reduction efforts available. So it's already at the soft limits to adaptation where loss and damage is starting. Um, but it's also something that comes to play where residual risks materialize in a climate related disaster and where really livelihoods of people's and people's homes are destroyed. So it comes into play both before that disaster happens because it is no longer feasible, no longer possible to reduce the risks further, to adapt to the risks further. But it's also a topic that we need to be addressing when disaster actually happens, because let's be honest, the disasters are happening and they're happening more and more. Um, Taking it, though, into a uh, language that is maybe more understandable to those at the decision making um, tables, to those that are looking at also their budget budgets and are wondering uh, how to uh, how to address this. It's really loss and damage is a question of contingent liabilities. We know that loss and damage will happen. It is a contingent liability and public finance ministers need to set up the necessary contingency funds, the necessary financial tools to address um, loss and damage in a way that supports those directly affected by it. Um, and that's something that I really want to underline also in the statement that the border of loss and damage is it's an important discussion to have, but it's even more important to have a discussion around how can we actually um, address loss and damage, how can we support the communities that are experiencing loss and damage, um, and how can we reduce the risk to the level 
where at least we can delay the materialization of loss and damage that cannot be managed um, to some extent. Thank you, Theresa. That was that was excellent. Um, and I think, or I know that at COP right now, civil society is really pushing for this financing of, of loss and damage, um, uh, but in the negotiations, uh, not quite so much is happening uh, currently. Let's see for the second week if the Global North or the developed countries that I use um, are going to pay up for loss and damage um, based on their historical emissions. Would anyone else in the panel like to join in and add their comments to this topic? Um, yes, I could add a point um, because in addition to this policy perspective, there is also the science perspective um, that goes also after the question of where to draw the line between what can still be considered adaptation and what is already loss and damage. Um, but this is, yeah, as Teresa also said, is a really hard question to answer um, because it varies also so strongly between individuals. Um, and it must also consider much more these so-called non-economic losses and damages. Um, so to give some food for thought, uh, questions could be, is a relocation due to a flood um, still adaptation or is it already lo loss and damage or is eating into your seed stock adaptation or is it loss and damage or is taking your child out of school so that it can earn money and work is that a form of adaptation or is it rather loss and damage so these could be some questions that uh, people would have to ask themselves in order to somewhere draw the line Right. Maybe we rather talk about how it's a matter of both necessary adaptation and a form of, of loss. Yes. Uh, Sumiti, did you, did you want to add something? Yeah, I actually had a question, um, perhaps for the other panelists also to respond to. How can research help with defining this? And what kind of research would we need further to interrogate where that boundary exists and and how differentiated it is because the way the conversation is going right now it sounds very almost at a personal level or a household level that it could be defined um yeah so some reflections back from them um great question sumiti and, and i i have thought about this a long time and also have applied different research methods uh, how to you know support these kind of of policy discussions and and actually you know existential discussions that we're seeing out there and and i think um so comprehensive climate risk management or an assessment framework um i mean this this has to comprise different methodologies as well. So I'm, I, I don't want to say that these quantitative expert-based risk assessments are not useful. I think they can be very useful to understand, particularly in a Global South context, if we, if we you know, arrive at a, at a national level adaptation limit, if we really see major challenges, fiscal, fiscal challenges, for example, that could show up uh, once we reach or once we experience certain disasters. But more and more in my research, I also realized that once we talk about adaptation limits, we talk about risk perceptions, we talk about uh, how are those communities or households affected by, by risks. Uh, how do we, they actually perceive those those risks? It's not me, uh, you know, this white Austrian man sitting in a literally sitting in a castle here. <laughs> so Yasa is situated in a castle in an old castle in Austria. It's not me sitting at my desk defining, deciding what is an adaptation limit, where do we need to do transformational risk management? Um, I think it's really important to to build on social science methods, participatory methods, in innovative participatory methods. For example, we're experiencing, uh, experimenting with serious games, with role play workshops, uh, with, with different stakeholder engagement methodologies to find out with the communities at risk, uh, where are those thresholds that Teresa, for example, has been uh, talking about, uh, to find out where are these intolerable risks and what could be done. So also Sumiti, you mentioned that it, it has to be, um, uh, a real uh, 
participatory decision-making process also, not only to identify risk tolerance levels, but also to identify what are potential measures that could be employed to be you know, acceptable, but also sustainable in the future. Because you, you're completely right. I mean, once the, the funding schemes are running out and drying out, uh, there has to be ownership in the communities of those adaptation measures. And they cannot be you know, just installed top down. It has to be a, a combination of top down and bottom up. And us researchers, I think we can play an important role there by developing, co-developing such methodologies, implementing such methodologies and being objective observers, uh, I would say. So, so we are becoming you know, partners of, of uh, climate risk management practice, not so much these experts telling everyone what to do. I think that's not, not the approach that will work in the future. Definitely, thank you, Thomas. Uh, Jocelyn, please. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting the discussion because uh, when we are also uh, supporting the countries to, to improve the policies related with climate change. But really, we don't know uh, uh, what are the cause of less adaptation plasticity due to climate change, really, in the, at the ecosystem level, for instance. So it, it, I think that we know that there are some differences and constraints related with socioeconomic issues or sociocultural issues for sure, but related with the plasticity of, of this ecosystem, it, we, we really, we, we know maybe there are some findings around these, these issues. However, we don't know really what are going to be the cause of this less plasticity, plasticity at, at the ecosystem level. So I think that the, the, from the science perspective, it's really important to contribute or try to, to create these channels to, to uh, support the, uh, the, uh, uh, the decision makers to, to include these elements in the discussion. As, as, because until now, we, we can see, as, as Thomas mentioned, the difference between uh, global and north conditions and these things. But related with some ecosystem, we really know maybe there are some findings that we can start the discussion with some elements. But, uh, I think that there is there is a, an important uh, demand to understand better the cause of this less plasticity at the ecosystem level uh, and try to 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 improve the the policy the policy uh, also with, with these elements. Uh, in my opinion, I, I saw that the discussion related with loss and damage um, sometimes are really focusing the payments that we, that some countries have to do to the other countries. But at, at the end, the, the, the essential of these elements are where are the, the or how will the ecosystem react to in, in the next years? You know, um, how plasticity will be in the next, in the, in the scenario that we are expecting in the future. Thank you, Jocelyn, that's a great addition. Um, so, Linda, you mentioned previously uh, quickly non-economic losses and damages. Could you explain what those are and, and how the discussion uh, around related loss and damage metrics should happen? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, so, there's right now no fixed definition yet of what non-economic losses and damages are. Um, I will call them NELD. Um, so in some articles, um, it was used as all the goods and services that are not commonly traded in markets. However, this does not really explain what NELs are, but rather what they are not. Um, so as in loss and damages can occur to those things that put that we can put a price tag on and that we can rebuild or rebuy, and NELs are just the rest. Um, but this does not pay tribute to the many dimensions um, of the things that we value and which just are not possible to express in monetary terms, like um, what is our physical or mental health worth to us. Um, or imagine after several floods, um, like a rural community is relocated or otherwise disperses, and how should we evaluate what they have lost, like 
losing their sense of community because they now live in a city where they know no one or um, which makes them also lose their informal support system during times of hardship or losing part of their identity because the places where their childhood memories come from are no longer there. Um, so in this trans loss project that um, Thomas has already mentioned, um, we were thinking about metrics and indicators and how to measure losses and damages with a special focus on this dimension that cannot be easily expressed in monetary term. But then again, climate change will either through adaptation or mitigation or else change all of our lives, at least in some way. Um, but not all of these changes are necessarily bad. For example, when we think of greener cities with less car traffic and more organic farming, because that's more resilient against heat and drought, um, these changes are forced upon us by climate change, but these aren't necessarily for the worst, so we don't have to consider them losses and damages. Um, but then, yeah, the question is again, where do we draw the line between mere changes and losses and damages? And this is, of course, extremely difficult because it is so highly individual, um, like one person maybe really suffers from an experience change and the other does not, or maybe even thrives under the new circumstances because the need for a change actually liberated them for, uh, in some form. But as a starting point, we as a research team all independently felt the need that there um, must be some kind of concept that covers all the areas of uh, life which people value um, throughout all cultures and generations. And so we thought of the concepts around human needs and human well-beings. Um, for example, there are um, some more widely known examples, the Maslow hierarchy of needs or the um, Brunei's uh, happiness index, but there are some more. Um, and then we started mapping the losses and damages, um, monetary or else, reported in the literature to existing concepts of human needs and human well-being, and it actually worked out pretty well. So these categories would um, or could be, uh, of course, the material living standards, um, but also mental health and physical health and primary relationships, um, ecosystem services and biodiversity, functioning communities, um, cultural heritage and diversity, knowledge and education, and also um, this governance, self-determination and participation domain. Um, and when evaluating losses and damages in monetary terms, the less privileged communities um, keep being deprioritized and resources are being channeled away from them because they just do not weigh enough in money. Um, but then seeing losses and damages through the lens of human needs and human well-being, um, everyone can be affected equally um, because every human has a physical health or and is dependent on the ecosystem services and so on. So we believe that viewing NELT through this lens um, can help to see a broader spectrum of possible losses and damages. And that lets ourselves and policymakers and decision makers understand better the range of what is at stake apart from the monetary losses um, and why it's really worth it to mitigate um, climate change, to close the circle from loss and damage to mitigation again. Yeah. Well, wow, thank you, Linda. That was that was really great, um, and also so interesting to hear about the importance of of bringing non-economic losses and damages up to the surface and and start including them uh, in policy as well, so that they are properly um, taken care of and not just the the monetarized losses and damages um, that happen. Um, would anyone from the panel like to jump in on this topic? Uh, I, Maybe I just, yes. Jocelyn, go ahead. No, I have just a thinking in my mind related with this, this uh, 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 topic, because I was in Cusco to one week ago uh, and I saw a lot of forest fire and I didn't understand why the local uh, farmers are really promoting these fires, even if they know that there is really a, a big damage in their ecosystems and, and, and Lively, <laughs> around. 
So I was also uh, with, with uh, Linda uh, participation. I, I, I really try to understand if there are some relation between these actions to, to promote this forest fire and the expectation of, of these farmers no? related with the uh, news around uh, the, that we are going to, to, lo to, lo to have a lot of lo uh, uh, lo losing no? uh, uh, related with the, with, with the environment. So I was just trying to understand if there, if there is a connection between the expectation of the local farmers and the um, news and the, the information that we are also promoting around these, these, to these, these topics no? related with the climate change. Yeah, that's an interesting input, definitely. Um, Thomas, did you have something as well? Yeah, I, w I just wanted to briefly highlight the importance of what, what Linda just mentioned. I mean, uh, this, this human well-being approach or, or perspective on loss and damage. I mean, loss and damage is often framed in a way, yeah, here are the global south countries who just want compensation. Then there are the global north countries who just don't want to pay compensation. So, so the, we, we have this dichotomy, at least a perceived uh, distinction. But I think once we apply this human well-being lens to loss and damage, I think it puts us all in the same basket. We all have the same human needs. We all have the same uh, uh, basic human needs and, and uh, also this pyramid that Linda mentioned. So I think this, this could help again to, to bridge the gaps in the, in the policy discourses, but also in practice. I mean, also the, the risk management perspective on loss and damage. Uh, we have started to, to work with this perspective because we also thought this can help to bridge the divides a, a bit in the whole discourse, uh, because it's still based on, on distributive justice concerns. But uh, it would breach. Uh, it would breach the the very you know two ends of the spectrum. And I think this human well-being approach would would even take it a step step further and uh, uh, showcase very directly. Hey, we're all humans. We we all have the same needs, and uh, we're all experiencing losses and damages from climate change to different degrees in the global south and global north. But it touches upon our our very fundamental needs. So I, I very much support uh, the, the thoughts of Linda, and I think this is a, a great area of future research. Also, so Sumiti, asked, you have been asking uh, what can research do? I think this, this can really be a, a very fruitful area of research. And also to bring this on the ground, not just leave it conceptual, but see what, what that means in reality. If I just, I also want to underline that, you know, making it understood to everyone that loss and damage is not something that's a compensation question per se. It's a question that can, it's something that actually affects all of us. It can affect all of us at really disastrous levels. It doesn't mean that all of us will experience loss and damage ourselves, but as Thomas was explaining from the um, project in Austria, but as probably all of you know from your home countries as well, um, climate change is already affecting the livelihoods of many, even in our communities. Um, I'm, for example, from Germany, where climate change has led to really much, much hotter summers than in previous years. And I'm sure that this is a familiar um, development in many countries. Um, but as a result, farmers have lost income. They have lost a lot of their production. You don't see it in the supermarkets yet, but it is very real to the farmers. Um, and that's also why it's, it's, it's a question of human well-being, of course, but it's also a question of um, really of liabilities that the farmers are facing. They need to make up for those um, losses that they have. And at the end of the day, we need to be able to, as, as researchers, we need to be able to translate our findings, our observations into languages that speak to the different communities that are trying, that are in charge of, of setting up these response mechanisms. And human well-being is certainly one of the languages that are being heard. Contingent liabilities is another language. It depends on the target audiences we're speaking to. But I do think, and I, uh, and I also will challenge us um, as those working on loss and damage to use the language that is understood by those that are currently ignoring loss and damage um, that will materialize more and more. Thank you, Teresa.
So maybe we move on now and uh, we still have a few interesting questions to talk about. Um, Sumiti, we have mentioned transformational change, um, but what exactly is the difference between incremental and transformational change? And why is incremental change thought to not be enough? Thank you for the question. Um, it really has had me thinking and it's also something that we've addressed in the chapter of the that was contributed to the book that um, Rich, uh, Reynard and Teresa are co-editors of. Uh, but to bring it very practically into the work I'm doing right now with the ARA, we've been talking about what is called radical collaboration. In many projects that we see, which are iconic of what action research looks like, for example, uh, we find that transformative adaptation sits apart from incremental because structural issues that prevent a lot of the justice uh, outcomes of research and practice projects are attended to. So the, the, the definition can be quite wide, but I think it's, it's linked to what are the changes or what are the scales at which changes are, being, are, are uh, happening and being captured or being enabled. So uh, again, I, I like to speak in examples. So for example, in this book chapter also, we looked at um, ABA or nature-based solutions, whereby um, we, we particularly looked at projects that had community empowerment as a critical factor. So previously I spoke about getting the voice of people in, but then I think from the discussion that we've just been having, there is that understanding that uh, there are limits and, and loss and losses and damages will happen and also communities when they get displaced how do they cope with it almost and how, how does it work at the multiple levels of emotions physical loss socioeconomic loss cultural loss but then what what does that in, in turn make happen so what we saw was there, there was a language or there was a narrative of empowerment with, where people take ownership and decide that something can be done, not perhaps in all situations that is possible without external help. But when you look at, uh, for example, in Bangladesh, there's huge uh, risks associated with flooding. And yet there are local NGOs that are working with communities to uh, well, I wouldn't like to use the word thrive, but yes, that is a narrative change that's happening. And uh, similarly, um, so to answer your question, transformative adaptation or radical collaboration, which are becoming at least merged in my head, is where we don't just have um, one organization on one level driving it. There are uh, multiple partners, there's multiple um, levels of engagement but also those that are affected are not seen as merely victims. So where there is agency, that is what, um, you know, there, there may not be an agency to shift things at a global scale, although voices from communities are trying to do that as, as we see in the COP, but changing our own circumstances. So yeah, I'll, I'll stop there, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sumati. That's really a great way of, of uh, explaining it, that people can be simultaneously impacted by these by these changes, but also themselves be agencies of change um, facing these, these issues. Would anyone else like to add to that statement? I would also like to ask, you mentioned a book, could you maybe uh, type out in the chat which this book is, so that everyone can reach it? I think Teresa is doing the, uh, thank you Teresa, because she's more familiar with the exact titles, but we've been working collaboratively for almost a year and learning from each other also. So I think transformation also happens at the level of the scholars or people like us who are involved and learning from, you know, the coming together of practice and research and different domains that we um, are more used to or more familiar with. But it doesn't capture the lived experience of uh, people who are harshly impacted by the climate crisis. Right. 
Thank you. So now that we have a working understanding, hopefully, of transformational change, um, how can we secure that transformational adaptation is equitable and just at the community level? What would you say, Thomas? Sumit here has already mentioned a couple of, of aspects what is important to make that happen but I think when we talk about transformation we often have those ex situ responses on our minds so like moving away from a source of risk or, or from, an, from a threat but uh, transformational adaptation in the literature has also been defined as, as truly tackling the root causes of vulnerability through justice, equity and poverty centered approaches. So let's look for a an example, for example, on, on pervasive drought and heat in agriculture. This could really lead to uh, uh, to forcing farming households to diversify their livelihoods towards non-farming income or completely aband abandoning ag agriculture. And of course, research, uh, we can provide important scientific insights to support transformational adaptation. But I, I would also agree with uh, Sumiti that we need transformational science here, not science that uh, researches transformation processes, but that engages actively in transformation processes. Because actions and solutions, they need to be identified and implemented through the active involvement of the communities at risk. And also the identification of the best mix of measures should be very context specific and, and based on participatory decision making to enhance the, the suitability and acceptance, but also effectiveness and sustainability of the measures. And in the context of Global South, I think development cooperation has a very important role to play also in connection to research, but also in connection to bottom up initiatives. Uh, so what we really need are holistic and adaptive approaches that links the communities, local and regional authorities to the national and international level and to different levels of action. And uh, I think this adaptive approach is important also because we need we need to be dynamic. Uh, the implementation of a robust monitoring, evaluation and learning frameworks that you know allow for feeding back into iterative integration processes uh, are key for, for making such uh, transformational uh, changes uh, really equitable and just at the local and community level. So we have to be flexible uh, to be able to adjust the implementation of CRM measures, climate risk management measures, uh, but also to inform future decisions and, and resource allocations, of course. So in in summary, I think it's it's really about this collaborative uh, uh, decision making and uh, climate risk management uh, approaches on the ground. It's nothing that can be imposed top down. It's really about um, yeah participatory decision making and science research plays an important role there, but all parts of society play an important role. And uh, the most important role is the, the communities, the households at risk. So we, we have to understand, we have to listen, uh, what, what are their risk tolerance thresholds? What, how are risks perceived? What are potential measures that can be implemented? Mm. Yeah, that's really great. Um, you mentioned just before uh, you, Jocelyn, you mentioned Global South Development Corporation. Could you develop a bit on that? Um, for the people that might not be familiar with what that means. Yeah, so so I think loss and damage uh, also overlaps with uh, with agendas of development corporations, of course, and, and how um, and that's also when we talk about finance, for example. So I, I do think that that quite some uh, you know concrete uh, measures or projects uh, addressing loss and damage will overlap or will come from uh, international development organizations. And um, I think that those organizations have very, you know, good uh, uh, good context and, and a very direct reach to the communities at risk. So for us researchers, it's it's often, we, we stay at a meta level, we, we sit on, you know, in our offices and we, we conceptualize about what could be transformational, what could be transformational risk management. But I think this connection also to development cooperation organizations who are working on the ground, who are also developing risk management frameworks and, and uh, uh, conceptual ideas how to deal with uh, with those risks, 
I, I think there's really a win-win situation to connect to those uh, as researchers, but also from the other side round uh, to, to jointly tackle those issues. Because then you really have this more bottom bottom up approach where you really work with communities where you have uh, the opportunity to to apply the methods that we are talking about these social science participatory methods. I mean, you can develop the best methods you want if you don't have uh, you know the the context, the the real uh, case studies on the ground to to do something with those methods. Yeah, it, it stays an academic exercise. So that's why I think it's so important to to find uh, those those allies and uh, also with with Teresa and other colleagues at Yasa, we, we we are closely working with uh, those development corporations to really bring our scientific knowledge on the ground but also to learn from those organizations and from from the communities at risk thank you that was very clear uh, Jocelyn you had your hand up Yes, I, I really have a question related with this transformational adaptation. Uh, if there is some indicators or, or maybe a way to 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 measure or, or maybe to to um, to know if this adaptation is going well, because I had a discussion my, with some colleagues and and we tried to promote the adaptation, but we are not going to be maybe we, probably we are responding some the short term demands at local level, but in the long in the long term it's going to be well that because it is part of my question, no? How we can uh, or maybe there are some indicators or, or maybe some index or something that we can uh, monitor to to be sure that we are going in, in the right way. There is something. Sumati, please. Thank you. I can quickly offer the principles that the ARA has developed, but that's for action research. And uh, since we are trying to work with action partners as well, there has been some discussion on whether we need a parallel set of principles for action projects as well. So I think uh, the one that Thomas mentioned last around addressing the root causes of vulnerability is one of those principles. Similarly, developing um, knowledge for research projects, which is demand driven and solutions oriented. So uh, often local people have a better idea of, as you said, long term issues, not just short term. So when they put their demands forward, it will be more embracing of you know, forward looking issues, not just current ones. Uh, similarly, there's the question of transdisciplinarity, which means involving societal members. So I could put the link for those principles for you because I'm sure I'm going to miss a few, but that, that's just a flavor of uh, some of them, which I suppose could be developed for practice as well. And at the same time, um, tools such as the flood resilience measurement for communities tool and other resilience measurement tools are useful approaches to get an understanding of where you're starting, what's your baseline of resilience in a given community, and then keep on repeatedly doing that, for example, after a disaster has struck or after there's been a flood, um, or at certain points um, in your project and in, in your intervention. Um, that can also be a way to assess, you know, take those pause, go to those pause points and assess where you are on your journey um, of tackling the root causes of of um, risk as well. So it very much so connects with uh, monitoring and evaluation and having the indicators in place um, to really be able to assess. And for that, in the transformation space, um, there's work going on, but so far um, I haven't seen a an assessment in the way that, for example, this resilience measurement um, assessment is going at projects and works together with communities to understand the resilience levels and how they're developing. But it certainly is something that would be useful um, when it comes to helping projects um, really get off the ground and, and keep going in the right direction. Thank you, Teresa. That's really good. Um, also, if you have any links to this flood resilience measurement tool or any more information, feel free to just post it in the in the chat so that everyone can access it. Um,
OK, so. I have one last question now for you, Jocelyn. Um, we've talked about transformational change and comprehensive climate risk management. Um, Jocelyn, can you develop your thoughts on the role of research in regards to these um, uh, frameworks in practice? We've already talked about this a bit, but how do we move from concepts and frameworks to, to applicable measures? Yes, well, it's really, I, I, I think that based on our experience in the project uh, um, here in, in the Andes, um, maybe one of the our departure point is related with the science evidence. No? So it's really important. And in all of the projects that we are also promoting, all of them have the element related with the research and the science. Uh, why? Because I think that it, it, trying to uh, go in from the concepts and framework to the, the applicable measure, we need to, to collaborate between the research and, and, and the practice. Uh, it means that we need to build a better interface with, with the user at the end no? uh, of, of the user of this knowledge and information. Uh, and then it means that we have to understand all the evaluation of, of, of the user of this information coming from a research entity uh, like a university, for instance, or, or, or material services, uh, um, and also the local farmers in, 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 in the ground. So uh, I think that one of the, the important role from, from the research is try to uh, play a uh, first we need to 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 support that they can play a, a more active uh, uh, participation uh, and and into this policy level or policy dialogue no and trying to 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 facilitate the coordination between our uh, brain also the, the understanding of all this information uh, by these uh, decision makers um I think that there are some elements, key elements, in my opinion, that are really important to 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 go in from from the concept to the application of, of measures. You know? first, as as you mentioned also before, they, they identifying this vulnerability. You no, know? where are also the potential opportunities uh, related with this new challenge at, at look, at related with climate change. I think that the, we, we need to understand what are going to be the scenarios e, e, to be projected in the future, but not only related with precipitation and temperature issues, but also uh, what are, as, as you mentioned, the socio socioeconomic conditions and what can be also the, lo the, the, the loss and damage or potential loss and damage elements to, to be considered in, 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 in the next years. Uh, it means that we need to uh, assess uh, uh, the potential climate risk around uh, some specific uh, areas, no a specific uh, local level. Um, yeah, because uh, the, if we can use the, the the available data to 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 try to to uh, share and also uh, uh, understand the real problem. For the for the final user or, or the local farmers, it's really uh, uh, we can also start a, a, in my opinion a more useful dialogue between the the science and, and, and the practice. No, in in all these value chain, um, we had a, a interesting example. No, in in one of the project uh, is Clima and this project, uh, we support the Meteo services to try to create this interface with the users. And, and in the past, probably the Meteo services just provide some information, but they didn't connect with all the users in the value change. And we, we started with some uh, workshops and, and, and create the, the connection with some specific uh, users. We, uh, or they actually, they uh, uh, create new ways to, to give the information and also they receive a feedback from these users and improve the, the, the services at the end. And also uh, create some uh, probably um, new products 
to improve the prevention related with frost, for instance, no? with frost then in, in the Andes, in the highlands. Um, so if we can uh, to, to understand a little more these, these uh, risks, and also if we can also create this, this interface, there is also an important element, uh, especially uh, in the arrangement with the local uh, um, or the users. No, uh, uh, we were also talking about the demands. No, if this kind of uh, uh, response or adaptation adaptation measures can also respond the demands, uh, and we had also a, an important case, no, uh, related with the uh, warning, uh, the, the warning alert system. Yeah, the warning. Uh, to this, some to some specific events, no, probably, and that's why I was also talking about the short-term demands. No, in, in some seasons there are really important food prices or, or related with the droughts and the things, and and in in that season the short-term demand is related with the, the hunger. No, and and if we can come with some. Uh, um, with a, a, a really important method, method or, or instrument or technology to prevent an important uh, uh, or maybe a, a big uh, disaster uh, for the population won't be the solution for their short-term demand. Uh, it means we have to understand what is happening uh, at local level and that's, that is also an important issue that we can consider in, in the in, in this uh, uh, way to coming from the concept to, to the application no we, we need to understand really what are the, 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 the demands of the population in, in the short term and also in the in the long term and we have to have the uh, ability to uh, explain the difference to the, the communities, no, the, this kind of difference and the opportunities of these uh, measures at the, the different levels, at term levels, level to the communities. Um, so it's really important to understand what are the ways to relieve this kind of crisis in the short term and in the long term, and also who are uh, the key decision makers at this at this este or the decision making to identify the ways to solve these, these demands or, or, or the problems and the type of information that they need, you know, because at the end, the, the, the people who will apply the measure will be the users uh, at local level. No, the, 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 no, no, from my side that I am in, in an office. As, <laughs> so that is also really a key issue that we, we have to understand in all the, the research process um, and the way that we, uh, and the mechanisms that we are also uh, promoting to, to share the information. So uh, in my opinion, there, there is really a, an important, um, uh, the research have a really important role and we have to strengthen the collaboration among the cross-disciplinary uh, uh, problems uh, at the field level. So I think that there is a, 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 a need or maybe a gap that, that we need to understand uh, better the, the context and the pro power relation, interaction relations at these different levels to, to promote uh, better solutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, really interesting points, um, especially with um, scientific organizations, not just providing the information, but also connecting to the users. Um, just yesterday, I listened in on a conversation from the uh, VMO, v uh, World Meteorological Organization, and they talked about how they're changing up their language from what is happening to really how is that going to impact people. Um, so, for example, we are going to have a wind of 60 knots will instead be, we will have a wind that can uproot trees. Um, so that this is something that people can really relate to and, and also respond to um, in a way. So that could be an example of this um, to really connect to the users. 
would anyone else like to add to this this um, conversation? OK. So um, thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you. A big thank you to the rest of the panel. Um, we are now ready for some questions from the audience. Um, and I will just check. There was a comment right in the beginning. Um, do you know of, from Tanya, do you know of countries that are using their commitment to the NDCs? So that's the nationally determined contributions um, in COP language. Uh, to mobilize resources towards loss and damage. If anyone would like to answer that. I see you've already kind of answered it in the comments. Maybe you want to expand on your on your answers. Uh, we can start with Sumiti. Um, I was actually answering from the adaptation lens, bringing science-based knowledge to NDCs and uh, shared the link to a project. But I think Teresa uh, mentioned Vietnam, so perhaps she can speak more about that, yeah? Right, so the NDC in Vietnam contains updates on loss and damage, um, and it contains updates in the sense that it is um, citing the damage that has been caused by um, natural disasters in Vietnam. Um, so that is one way to approach um, the NDCs as an angle to, to track loss and damage. Um, I'm not aware of other countries. There might be others that are tracking their loss and damage. Um, I'm not aware also of countries that are indeed tracking um, what they're putting to addressing loss and damage, which may be more the question, where the question is um, angled at. But maybe others in the group do know. I do know, though, that um, this is something that is being called for increasingly by countries, um, especially by developing countries, to use NDCs as a way to track um, contributions for loss and damage. I'm, I'm not aware of any other NDCs. Um, I think what where, where this often is being discussed is also in the context of um, uh, support. So because loss and damage is extremely tough to measure. I think we have we have uh, discussed that in, in great depth today. And uh, I think throughout the, the UNFCCC member countries, there, there's not not one kind of methodology that is that is applied or that's the go to place how to assess and how to monitor losses and damages so i think this is something that will definitely be discussed uh, also at this cop 26 how to really measure losses and damages and how this can then be included in future ndcs i think currently um, might be mentioned in more qualitative terms, but I, I don't know if NDCs with very you know hard quantitative effects on, on losses and damages. And of course, in, in the finance discussions, there will also be uh, further uh, discussions around uh, losses and damages, um, potential needs. So, so there is now the discussion that countries should, uh, should announce their needs in terms of addressing not only climate change adaptation and mitigation, but also losses and damages. But also there, I think the methodologies are are really the yeah missing missing aspect at the moment. And just to add to this, because this measurement question, it's not a question that has come up exclusively to loss and damage in the context of UNFCCC conversations. It's a question that is um, in parallel discussed, heavily discussed, and has posed heavy, great problems, as um, Thomas has pointed out as well. Um, in the discussions around the Senda framework on disaster risk reduction under UNDRR, um, their countries have committed also to reducing the losses and damages from natural disasters, from disasters beyond the climate-related ones. Um, and when it came to the first reporting period, it has shown to be extremely complicated to agree on common methodologies to measure what qualifies as even something as simple and straightforward as economic loss and damages, uh, or something that, you know, to an outsider of these conversations would seem as the most obvious question is the question, when do you count a person as killed by a disaster? There is no common international standard for that. Do you count them? Do you count someone as dead? 
after they've got after they've disappeared after they've been missing for a week two weeks three three years you know what is this what are these measures um so it is it will be useful to better link up with those parallel discussions parallel conversations um that are happening under um the realm of UNDR on the Sendai framework when trying to find answers to loss and damage from climate change but it will be com complicated in any case um, to find an agreement there And I do want to point out also there has been some statistics out um, that try to capture economic loss and damage. Um, and even that, it's it's just so complicated to compare um, because things such as indirect losses, then indirect economic losses that result from the disruption of business, they cannot be measured, but, but not in a way that is comparable anyway. They can be modeled, but they cannot be measured um, to the extent that would be useful for comparison and it makes it very difficult to then also have conclusive um, insights from that data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I think that the, 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 if we can go beyond the, the economic loss and damage, we can understand oh, maybe the, the, the countries uh, uh, that can also uh, uh, include a little more the, this, this topic into the NDCs. Because I, in my opinion, the understanding of loss and damage is 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 really no no not so easy to 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 include in, in the discussion to to promote or to, to to propose the NDCs. In the case of Peru, the the the, the definition of the NDCs uh, include a, really a participative process. Uh, that have also uh, considered the, the dialogue be between the different levels, no? from local and also the national level, and to explain uh, what loss and damage means is really a, not so easy for, for, the, for, for the different use uh, levels no? in, in the country. So I think that to understand a little more what loss and damage means and the difference between economic and the other loss and damage will be really important uh, to, to include this topic in, in, into the NDCs. Sumiti, so, you've sent some great links here. Would you like to explain what those are? Yeah, um, yeah I think we are very close to the ending time also, so not take up too much space, but uh, of course, an apparent building the capacity of these developed countries in uh, mapping and measuring um, damage. But that's uh, a few years on. And so say if one could get more information, if you want to be another country to look at, if that's the question that's come from the audience to Vietnam, uh, whereby uh, NDC was damage. Based on technical work, it seems. Thank you. So we are close to finishing and I just have one one last question. Um, I know you're all joining remotely, uh, but if you were at the climate negotiations right now in Glasgow, what would be the one message that you would like to get across to policymakers? Um, very short, short message. Recognize loss and damage and step up to respond to it. I would say stop working in silos. And I really liked when Linda said loss and damage connects back to mitigation. So. Then I'll go ahead and say consider loss and damage in order to justify more mitigation. I may say um, so recognize the loss and damage and go beyond the the, the traditional mechanisms to solve it. Something. 
Yeah, I, I would raise my concern that if if those topics like loss and damage, residual risks are not being considered and addressed properly, you guys might risk uh, getting any uh, results from this COP. Excellent. Very good way to finish. Um, this is all the time that we have for today. Thank you everyone for joining today's event and a big thank you to all the panelists for a very interesting and food for thought um, discussion. I wish you all a very good day. Thanks, Thank Isabel. you for Thanks. excellent sharing.